SCP-6217 The Emergence The SCP universe is one in which the normal rules of existence, such as the various laws of physics, biology, chemistry, and mathematics, are routinely broken. Anomalies wouldn't be very anomalous if they didn't shatter the laws of nature on a regular basis, but despite all of this, the Foundation still manages to keep things pretty well contained, generally. What's perhaps surprising is that there aren't more large-scale anomalies that break these laws on a global or universal scale. Sure, there are anomalies that mess with physics or chemistry in a very localized area, but what would happen if the whole world suddenly experienced an issue with the way chemistry worked, for example? That's what SCP-6217 deals with, although the reasons for this sort of breakdown are much more than meet the eye. The document begins by being accessed by a Foundation researcher, noting that the date is currently June 22, 2041, and today is their 6,217th day working at the Foundation. When the document is accessed, the system remarks that it was last accessed a number of days ago, although the number errors out due to an integer overflow. There's also a warning present that the document is under a continuous internal attack and has thus been autonomously locked, although it provides another error this time in hexadecimal code. This can be translated, although since it consists of something of a spoiler, we'll get to that later. SCP-6217 carries the Apollyon object class, which is pretty simple in that it just means that the anomaly cannot be contained by any means known to the Foundation. In fact, the special containment procedures simply state, not applicable. The description for 6217 is that it is the underlying anomalous phenomenon causing a progressing CC class collapse of chemistry scenario. It's expected that 6217 will exterminate all carbon based life within one year. That's the entirety of the current 6217 document, which paints an extremely grim picture for humanity. Of course, we'll later get to what exactly a collapse of chemistry scenario is, but it suggests that the laws of chemistry as we know them have broken down, leading to some big problems. We're provided an older version of the 6217 documentation that will explain much more about what's going on. Here, 6217 is given the object class of Keter, and is described as the basis of several sub-anomalies originating within the New Stony Lake in Ohio and its surrounding villages and towns. What was originally only three surrounding towns later expanded to seven, then ten, then seventeen. It's postulated that no inhabitants within that area are non-anomalous humans. Other 6217 related descriptions have been redacted in accordance with the directives of the O5 Council, but we'll learn more about that. Initially, the three villages and towns located within the area had been considered inactive since 2009, with the anomalous nature of the location discovered during a routine exploratory operation conducted by three MTF agents. The team departs from the New Stony Lake United Methodist Church towards the lake, soon finding the grass to become a dark black color and the soil a deep rusted red. After collecting a sample of the soil and grass, the captain of the team looks up at the trees ahead, showing them to have no leaves, and a flock of black birds are sitting among the branches, staring at the team. They radio into command that there's some unexpected fauna out here, but they continue on, eventually coming across a small dilapidated community of ten homes near the deeply colored lake. The houses have all been stripped violently of their gutters, garage doors, and other metal. As the wind blows, the houses sway loosely and several crashing sounds are heard as a number of humanoids can be seen inside the houses 
through the open windows, appearing to aimlessly pace about. The hostile engagement specialist of the team takes point, and they begin moving towards the houses, finding that the central road has been torn up, with branching trenches leading towards each house. Shattered glass litters the ground, and several wooden utility poles have been knocked over, with what appears to be claw marks running along their height. Upon the still standing poles, more black birds watch the team approach. The team doesn't get any movement readings from one of the houses, so they decide to investigate inside, pausing for a moment as the house sways and creaks from a strong gust of wind. The trench dug up to the house from the road has been filled with rain, which appears to be running uphill towards the road. They take a sample of the trench water before stepping up to the porch. The front door lays haphazardly on the ground, having had its hinges and doorknob forcefully removed. Inside of the house, a couch has had its fabric and innards strewn about. The majority of the ceiling has collapsed, and the floor has caved into the basement, leaving only the support beams and the attached floorboards intact. The team instead tries to go through the garage, finding shreds of rubber and leather strewn across the floor and piled by the walls. They go through the door here into the kitchen, where the appliances have all been ripped away from the walls, and moldering food covers the counters. They suddenly hear a noise, and a cabinet begins to rapidly shake. As the engagement specialist readies her rifle and opens the cabinet, a large black bird flies out and out the window, spraying a thick black substance over the room and the team with every wing flap. A pile of black sludge begins to inch its way out of the cabinet and towards the window before being captured and added to the other samples. As they leave the house towards the lake, one of the team questions that all of this violence would be from slugs and birds but the captain says that they've seen weirder. Once there was a doll that teleported back to where it was five seconds ago, and it got stuck on the conveyor belt at the incoming anomaly dock for four days. Apparently it had somehow caused the deaths of a full apartment building. The other member of the team laughs and says that this isn't the weirdest they've seen by far, as one time there was something living in a toilet at an Applebee's. The engagement specialist tells them to quiet down though, as there's something moving in the trees up ahead and it's been watching them since they left the house. She decides to split off from the group to check it out while they continue towards the lake. At the lake shore, the captain takes a sample of the lake water while discussing the engagement specialist and how she's usually pretty good at this kind of thing. Suddenly. A flare shoots out of the trees into the sky and explodes into blue smoke, signifying danger. The tactician tells the captain, the chemist of the team, to move silently back towards the house, and if anything seems wrong to either hide in the grass or make a run for it. The tactician runs off towards the woods, while the captain starts quietly walking back towards the house. As the houses come back into view, the humanoid entities can no longer be seen, and the sounds of footsteps and branches snapping are heard emanating from the woods. The captain begins to jog towards the kitchen door, bursting into the kitchen and lifting the door back up against the frame to catch her breath. After a moment, the house begins to creak with footsteps upstairs, moving slowly towards the staircase. The captain raises her pistol and points it towards the kitchen entryway, and after a few moments of silence, something large crashes through the kitchen window, causing the captain to turn and fire. The shot connects, hitting the tactician in the arm, who just yells at her to keep moving. They move towards the garage, hearing a large wet thump sound in the living room next to them, as the captain asks where the other team member is. The tactician tells her not to worry about it, because she got there in time to see her being dragged back towards the lake and being submerged by some humanoid covered in tendrils of that goo. If she's okay, then she'll figure it out, and if not, then it's not their worry right now. 
They reach the garage door opening, looking out towards the road where they see 15 elderly people wandering aimlessly and staring at the sky. The captain looks up to see what has drawn their attention, at which point the black birds in the trees nearby take flight, forming a massive swarm in the sky and blocking out the sunlight. As the birds fly erratically, the black sludge drips down onto the road and the humanoids, forming pools on the street that begin to grow in size by moving and combining with smaller puddles. As the droplets land upon the elderly people, they form long, thin tendrils stretching from their bodies like long fur. The birds then begin to swarm into a single ring in the sky, sending individual birds down to peck and claw at the two agents as they step out. The tactician tells the captain to sprint for the car and not wait for anything. As the captain sprints towards the tree line they first came from, the tactician sprints down the street, with the birds descending down like a coil towards her. Several birds take notice of the captain and descend upon her as well, pecking and scratching at her exposed skin. She turns to look towards the direction of the tactician, witnessing her being lifted into the air by the swarm and disappearing into the sky. The coil of birds then turn towards her and begin swooping in just as she reaches the trees. She pushes through the branches as she runs, shoving metallic twigs and birds to the ground along the way. As the swarm catches up to her, she removes her helmet, headset, and body armor, tossing them aside for greater mobility, retaining only her pistol, samples, and camera. She bursts forth from the tree line, landing near where she took her initial soil samples, covering her head with her arms as she curls into a ball. She then flips onto her back and fires six shots towards the swarm, causing them to divert their flight path. She then stands and begins sprinting again, searching for where the black grass stops. Unfortunately, the boundary of black grass has now extended to the back edge of the church, and the Foundation vehicle is missing. She instead sprints towards the house on the other side of the road, crashing through the door and tumbling onto a coffee table near a family sitting down for dinner. The man asks if they can help her, to which she simply responds that she needs to use their phone. In the aftermath, the two other agents are both presumed to be lost, although no remains have been identified. So that all seemed pretty odd, with some mysterious black sludge, crazy birds, and metal stripped from every house in the area. Its connection to the collapse of chemistry scenario doesn't seem to be too obvious at this point, but let's continue on with the Foundation's further investigations of the region. Analysis of the footage and samples collected show that almost all organisms within the area, including animals, plants, and microorganisms, exhibit a complex set of symptoms of an incurable disease, now designated as 6217-A. Tissue samples of organisms infected by this disease were found to have had their hydrocarbon composition replaced by a complex mixture of iron and sulfur. As of the third exploration, a total of 23 human instances with this disease have been identified, and no healthy residents have yet been observed in the area. All missing prior residents of the location are assumed to be deceased, and all human instances found have been relocated to Site 6217 for medical treatment and experimentation. We're provided an interview between a Foundation researcher and one of the infected subjects, a 43-year-old man that was found alone and discovered to be the most symptomatic of the individuals, displaying significant psychiatric symptoms connected to the disease. Initial physical examination showed that approximately 43% of his total gross biological tissue had been replaced by iron-sulfur complexes and small black patches are visible on his skin. The man says that he wants to go back home, and asks if they are in league with that thing to throw him into the lake. 
The doctor says that he's only here to ask him some questions, and they'll provide him with medical coverage and protection. It seems that the man is especially worried about whatever the thing is in the lake that will take him. The doctor asks about the man's wife and where she might be, to which the man says that she went to the lake a week before the foundation showed up. Before she went, she became very fond of iron and sulfur, eating all of the iron pans in the house, the pipes, the steel frames, somehow. Then she ate the rubber on the tires and the dirt outside, eating everything she could and leaving nothing for him. Physically, she had lots of black spots all over her body, and these horrifying black tentacles. And then she started dreaming about that thing every day. She couldn't close her eyes without thinking about it until it pulled her into the lake. She cried in front of him every day about her dreams, saying that she got closer to the lake every day, and tried to escape, but felt unable to move her legs. He couldn't help her, and now they're coming for him, too. They are screaming everywhere, and come to him in his dreams, roaring in his head. Every time he falls asleep, he dreams that he's standing by a lake, surrounded by a white mist. Then the black water starts to bubble, and when they burst, they make the sound of metal rods crashing all around him. Then he looks up from the bubbles, and there's a monster standing in the lake. Every time he sleeps, he gets a little closer to it, and last time he fell asleep, he was almost touching the water. He can't really describe the monster, as the mist is always too thick to see it clearly. It was taller than all the surrounding mountains, with its head in the clouds, but he couldn't see anything more than that. It just stood there in the fog, calling to him, roaring directly in his head. Whenever he sees it, it's as if there's a force making his body involuntarily come towards it. He also says that everyone he knows has dreamed about it lately, and as soon as you get caught by it, it engulfs you and becomes your life, pulling you into the lake. You'd go outside and the whole neighborhood would be standing in the moonlight, looking at the water. Then the next day everyone would be talking about wanting to go for a swim, or have a barbecue down by the water. The wind then blows outside the interview room, blowing the windows open and sending a howling sound throughout the ward. The man freezes and slowly looks down at his hands before beginning to tremble. The doctor asks him what's happening, but the man just screams that it's coming again, before whispering it's coming again over and over to himself for the next 30 seconds. He then cries out, telling the demon to get away from him, as he's an independent person and won't be consumed by it. He then begins to thrash around his bed, prompting the caretaker beside him to hold him down and place him in restraints. The doctor tries to calm him down, telling him that this place is safe, but the man says that he doesn't understand, because they are inside him, coming through the windows. This room is already filled with them, and they whisper in his ears, mocking him and calling to him. They want him to go to the lake, to his wife, saying that his wife is part of them and part of that monster. The man begins to shiver and cry as the doctor assures him that he'll be fine, but the man says that he can hear his wife saying that to him as well, as they have her voice. They want him to get swallowed up by the demons in the lake, and they want everyone to go down there too. The doctor stands and closes the window, stopping the sound of the wind, as the man settles down. He says that he feels like he's changing, but he's a person, a human, not a part of it, and tells it to give his wife back. He then begins to cry deeply again, ending the interview. Obviously, this lake is the center of attention where the anomaly is concerned, 
So the Foundation sends in an unmanned submersible to investigate. As it's sent in, the camera footage shows that the water is light brown in color, with relatively good visibility, and it descends to a depth of about 4 meters, at which point a small, black, fibrous entity suddenly appears on the edge of the camera's view before quickly leaving. The submersible continues along the shore, eventually finding a bivalve, shellfish-like entity, with roughly 40 elongated black tentacle-like structures protruding from the shell and swinging in the water at the rocks of the lakeshore. Several metallic, mechanical structures of various sizes, including gears, motors, and levers, are observed on the slope of the lakeshore, with their surfaces severely rusted. A large number of tiny, oily, and fibrous materials are seen on the surface of the mechanical structures. The submersible then travels towards the center of the lake, seeing several more entities appearing in the field of vision before leaving as the submersible approaches them. Another large entity moves close to it and attempts to wrap its tentacle-like structures around it, but thanks to a quick escape maneuver, the submersible escapes unscathed. At a depth of roughly 10 meters, a large number of tiny, black, oil, droplet-like spherical entities are observed floating in the water, appearing to have the ability to move on their own through a pulsing motion akin to a jellyfish. They remain stationary in the absence of disturbance, but actively evade the submersible when the latter comes close to them. It continues to dive deeper and the number and size of the observed oil droplets gradually increase. At 12 meters, several necklace-like structures consisting of four to seven interconnected oil droplets are observed wriggling in the water. A fish-like entity about two meters long then appears, with all of the tissues on its back and tail seen sloughing off as the submersible approaches leaving only the skeleton connected by black, fibrous materials still swimming. Several small black oil droplets continue to separate from the fibrous materials with every movement. The remaining tissues of the front half of the entity are completely covered by a large amount of black substances, forming ribbon-like, tentacle-like, and wheel-like large structures on the skin. Some of the tissues around the eyes are detached, and the skeleton is exposed. During swimming, the black material on its body surface continually releases the black oil droplets of various sizes to the environment. The submersible descends to a depth of about 18 meters, observing a school of fish swimming in the distance, all of which are covered with black material and have a large number of forked tentacles and sarcoma-like structures extending outward from their bodies. Two entities observed appear to be only fish skeletons connected by black fibers. One of the entities suddenly stops moving after swimming for a few seconds, and the black fibers attached to the skeleton break apart into droplets, followed by the skeleton breaking up and sinking deeper. No fish are seen below a depth of 20 meters, but the number of black oil droplets increases considerably, and some with a diameter of about 10 centimeters begin to appear. Necklace-like structures consisting of dozens of droplets are observed at a depth of about 30 meters, extending upward from the deeper area and twisting and oscillating in the water, with lengths ranging from 5 to 20 meters. At one point, the submersible accidentally makes contact with a chain-like structure, which quickly wraps around it. Despite successfully escaping, the submersible's surfacing system is damaged irreparably, and it's deemed irrecoverable from this point on. It continues to sink to around 40 meters, and with the help of its illumination lamp, an unidentified giant entity with a roughly cylindrical shape is observed swimming below the submersible from the deeper area, with an estimated cross-sectional diameter of about 5 meters, and a length of about 20 meters. The surface features of the entity resemble complex mechanical and fractal structures, 
although these specific structural details couldn't be clearly observed. At 50 meters, a large number of complex, net-like structures are observed filling the area below this depth. Droplet entities of varying sizes are continuously dislodged from each net and swim into the holes of other nets, integrating themselves within the new structure after a short period of time. The camera captures a cumulative total of three similar giant cylindrical entities swimming far in the distance. The submersible sinks into one of these nets and is rapidly and completely enveloped. The camera frame changes to total blackness, and a few seconds later it loses its signal. So, there's something at the bottom of the lake that's making loads of black goo that seems to take various structural shapes and also appears to be alive, in a sense, attacking anything foreign. Five days after his initial interview, Medical staff conducted a thorough physical examination on that infected man, finding that the internal structure of his body had completely changed in composition. All of his original nerves, blood vessels, and other tissues had been replaced completely by different tissues formed out of the black substance, and his organs had transformed completely into structures never before seen. This would seem to also be what happened to all of the fish in the lake, and everything else living in the area, in some sort of a grey goo scenario. Following his physical examination, he began entering frequent states of mania, stopped communicating with others, and attempted several times to escape. Staff began to keep records of all events involving him trying to harm guards, doctors, staff members, and researchers. Six days after the examination, an incident occurred that started with him in his room, staring at the camera, as a black, fibrous material extended out of him and began to cover his entire body. He continued to stand in place and stare at the camera as this occurred before his body suddenly shattered and collapsed. The process produced a large number of black spherical droplets of varying size that fell to the ground and rolled outward with a relatively large aggregation of black droplets at his standing position. The nearby droplets then recoiled and slowly clustered toward the center, merging together. The black droplet aggregate then began to shake and deform, shifting its appearance between multiple forms rapidly, with several new, complicated structures seen forming on the surface. It then formed into a singular entity with a redacted appearance, and a large number of rotating, gear-like structures could be seen on its surface, interconnected by encircling, fibrous structures. The black entity then suddenly broke through the door of the room at an accelerated speed before changing its appearance into another redacted form. The disc-like structure on the entity's surface rotates at high speed, driving its thousands of tree-like cable structures to move. It quickly entangles the two guards standing outside of the room and binds them inside its mass of curled tentacles. It proceeds to capture 12 more people in the site, eventually breaking through outside with its victims bound by its tentacles, moving towards New Stony Lake with great speed. The 15 individuals involved in the incident have been presumed lost, and the Foundation decided to release all other individuals with significant symptoms back to the region surrounding the lake in order to prevent additional loss of life. We're next provided some more info on this black substance that seems to be spreading and corrupting everything. It's based on iron-sulfur cluster compounds, and found naturally within New Stony Lake. Derivative substances of the stuff found in the lake have been found in body tissues, fibrous structures on the skin, secretions, and excretions of infected individuals. Experiments have confirmed that the infection is caused directly by contact exposure to any of the substance. 
theoretically, these substances are not thermodynamically stable and cannot exist outside of a vacuum environment. Therefore, their presence itself here is considered an anomalous phenomenon. Under natural conditions, it has an intrinsic tendency to spontaneously aggregate and assemble into larger specific structures. The corresponding substances, aggregates, objects have been designated as 6217b-1 through b-4, based on their different levels of assembly. The theorized final assembly level has been designated as b-5, although it is still unclear whether it exists and what its nature is. B-1 refers to the basic and most prevalent components of the substance, which are chain-like polymers of different sizes and molecular weights formed by several iron-sulfur atom clusters. These substances dissolve in water and are considered the underlying cause of the rusty brown color of the water in New Stony Lake. Skipping over some of the chemistry terms, these components can fold to form various, more complex substances, and they follow a completely different set of chemical laws compared with usual iron compounds. It's impossible to synthesize any of these compounds with normal iron and sulfur containing precursors obtained outside of the lake area. But if normal iron and sulfur materials are mixed with the anomalous ones, their tendency to spontaneously assemble into B1 will rise significantly. They can also continue to pass on this anomalous property to other normal iron and sulfur atoms upon contact. I think we're starting to get a better picture of this collapse of chemistry scenario. The lead researcher notes that B1 is one of the most unique anomalies he has ever encountered at the Foundation, and the assembly of these atoms, rather than describing it in terms of thermodynamics or chemistry, is much more similar to a deliberately built sculpture. As he works more with them, he questions if the atoms in these substances are even remotely like those he's worked with previously. It's as if they are no longer iron and sulfur atoms, as if something has changed them and transformed them into something else completely. This isn't even to mention that they are actually able to infect normal atoms, comparing it to a zombie crisis at the atomic level. He remarks that if these abnormal substances are allowed out, He's afraid that it will definitely trigger catastrophic consequences for life as humans have come to know it. B2 is a kind of molecular aggregate based on iron-sulfur clusters that behave similar to molecular machines, such as molecular motors and bearings capable of performing a series of complex functions. They are found abundantly in the lake water of New Stony Lake and under suitable conditions they will spontaneously aggregate further to form other structures, B3. B2 entities form various different structures and utilize energy from different sources as the driving force of their motion. Depending on their structure, they can create their own chemical energy for their own motion, and all B2 instances can use current generated by light as an available source of energy. Tens of thousands of B2 instances with different structures and functions have been identified, and the detailed structures of most of them are still unknown. A few kinds have been structurally analyzed with X-ray diffraction and other characterization methods, which have confirmed that B2 instances are formed through the folding of B1 substances. As well, the exact folding mode of the B1 compounds depends on their charge and the type of ligands on their surface, which lead to the formation of different B2 structures and functions. Despite this, the experimental and observational results are still contrary to the theoretical prediction, meaning that the folding patterns of B2 are not following what Foundation researchers would expect. Simulations have also failed to reproduce their observed motions, 
which may indicate that further investigation of the underlying physical mechanisms of motion is needed. We're being hit with a lot of terminology here, but basically this black goop is forming itself into increasingly complex machines and structures in ways that are unpredictable to human scientists. The head researcher says that while B1 can be regarded as analogs of amino acids and peptides, B2 can be seen as the counterparts of proteins. The way of folding from B1 to B2 reminds him of Chinese and Japanese origami, with the same simple piece of paper being able to have different shapes, functions, and movements if you fold it in different forms. Some origami structures, however, such as a paper spring that is pressed tightly, are not that stable, and can only keep that shape if you press them with your hand. The structure of many of the B2 instances roughly gives him the feeling that something keeps holding them in their present shape, and controls their movements like controlling marionettes. It's his intent to find this entity, although he doesn't know why. He shouldn't have an attitude like that towards these molecular structure models. But ever since he arrived here, he's had a lingering gear in the back of his mind when he looks at these structures. It makes it hard to think clearly and rationally, and wonders if it's a mental influence, a cognitive hazard, or something else. He remarks that these things lack the vitality of life, and his instincts are keeping him away from them. In his fear, he had conceived of these atoms as dead, empty shells, lacking a tangible feeling. They were no longer iron or sulfur atoms, as something had killed them and was manipulating them. They had become corpses to him, sewn together by some unknown, uncaring force. The structures of B2 are Frankenstein's monsters, made up of tens of thousands of corpses. They seem to be driven solely by the hunger for energy, unsatisfactorily devouring it voraciously from the outside world, and then using it in their own twisted actions, and in the process, damning other matter to their same merciless fate. B3, the next step up, are a collection of vesicle-like structures of varying sizes, generally appearing as black circular droplets ranging in size from 5 micrometers to 10 centimeters, containing a variety of B2 with different functions working together. B3 entities behave similarly to organics-based cells, in that they have the ability to act autonomously and can ingest similarly composed matter from the surrounding environment for their own growth. Each one often contains multiple energy harvesting B2 individuals within it, which makes them extremely efficient at utilizing energy from iron and sulfur sources as operational power. The researcher inputs a note here that they are feeding on themselves and the earth, and their hunger may never end on this planet of silica. Under high concentrations, B3 tends to aggregate spontaneously to form necklace-like B4 structures, as well as more complicated B4 aggregates. The researcher writes that he watches them flagellate in the petri dishes, feasting on each other and whatever iron and minerals they can reach, but they are not without intention. It's like nothing he's ever seen, as they seem to be thinking, together, and speaking. As he looks down through his microscope, he can feel them looking back up at him, urging him to feed them. He deposited a handful of soil and a nail into their beaker today, and for a moment, it stopped. They tore through both like a swarm of rabid piranha, and left him with silence for the following hour. He wonders if maybe some new containment measures are required. B4 
B4 refers to structures formed from B3, which are extremely complex and diverse in shape. The most common structures are tree and necklace shaped entities, which are considered as their primary form. The vast majority with complicated shapes have partially mechanical-like characteristics, with their structures often containing parts that are similar in shape and structure to mechanical designs, such as gears, hydraulic pistons, axles, and electrical circuits. B4 entities can be classified into different types based on their internal structure, similar to multicellular organisms. They are typically able to deform and move autonomously, and they are aggressive towards entities and objects containing iron and sulfur based materials, as well as regular creatures, resulting in them becoming infected with the disease. The researcher notes that B4 entities appear to be attracted to human blood, and will enter a frenzy when blood is entered into their immediate environment. It is presumed that this is because of the iron in our hemoglobin, but this is yet to be tested thoroughly. Under certain conditions, different B4 instances will further merge and assemble into more complex B4 entities, with the largest known one being a massive, reticulated structure found at the bottom of New Stony Lake. It's assumed that infecting organisms is an important way for B4 to reproduce, and they can also obtain the energy necessary for their growth and activity by oxidizing organic components of the organic tissues of the host. When a sample of B4 comes into contact with an organism, it will release some of its B2 instances into the body, rapidly infecting it and turning it into an instance of 6217-A-1. When infected by these B2 instances, the organism will seek and ingest large amounts of iron and sulfur to synthesize more B2, which then combines to form B3 instances, followed by B4, replacing the host's original body tissues. The newly generated B4, capable of replacing the original body organs of the host, often have different structures and operating mechanisms from the original organs, mimicking various mechanical devices instead of organ systems. In one occurrence, a human heart was replaced by a mechanical membrane pump. Nerve tissues were replaced by a wire-like system and a brain was replaced by a modular structure similar in principle to an electronic computer motherboard, assembled with various accessories. When the infected individual enters their final stage of infection, they will become compelled to enter into New Stony Lake. Once they reach the water, the B substances will be released into the lake, completing the reproduction process of B4. This pathway is currently speculated to be one of the main sources of the B substances within New Stony Lake. The researcher writes that the B substances bear similarity to parasitic wasps and fungi, laying their eggs or spores inside their hosts, manipulating their hosts to find nutrients in a suitable environment for their descendants, and finally killing the hosts and releasing the new entities. Once infected, the hosts are not of their own free will, and are obedient entirely to the infection. Yet the one man they interviewed resisted, which makes no sense. Unlike the other B entities, he's left with nothing but emptiness looking at the samples of B4. No matter how much he feeds them, no matter what he feeds them, they behave as soulless machines working to consume and infect, and nothing more. It's as if everything they do follows a command, written long ago, telling them to do this, telling them to reproduce, to attack, to go back to the lake, to bond with others of their kind. The creatures manipulated by them see the lake as their home, and fall into the water, one after another. Something in the lake is calling them, 
and he's afraid that it's not some monster, but rather instructions buried deep in the tiniest mechanical structures of these entities. Their own mechanical structures command them to return to the lake as it's part of them. They cannot resist, they will not resist, and once you become them, it's part of you too. He just questions why. Finally, B5 is the theorized final form produced by the self-assembly process of the B substances. B5 is suspected to be related to the giant black entity at the bottom of the lake described by several infected humans as appearing in their dreams. The existence of B5 is not yet confirmed. The researcher leaves only a short note here, asking, could it be? Alright, so altogether, we have a collection of mysterious substances that seem to be alive, in a sense, consuming everything made out of metal in order to continue growing, and also infecting other organisms in order to aid them in seeking out more sources of metal, all so they can continue to contribute more and more to a large entity at the bottom of the lake. All of these substances are increasingly mechanical in design, up to and including gears, pistons, and electrical circuits, so it's presumed that whatever is at the bottom of the lake is an even more complex machine of some sort. They're slowly building this entity using everything nearby that's made of or includes metal, including people, and all of the substances seem to be following a command instructing them to do this. They also, during the infection process, turn humans into mechanical creatures, replacing hearts, brains, and other organs with mechanical alternatives. If you've been following the SCP universe in some fashion for a while, you likely have a good idea what this is all pointing to and so does the Foundation. They bring in another infected individual to be interviewed, named Michael Christensen. At the time of his discovery, he had only a minor infection and was in the early stages, but he was interviewed due to a background investigation revealing that he was a former member of the Broken Church, the largest sect of the Church of the Broken God. He was asked about SCP-6217 due to the similarity between it and other anomalies associated with the church. The lead researcher, Dr. Chugaev, mentions that they brought him in due to the similarities and the fact that they found him lurking around the lake. Michael, however, says that the lake does have some relevance to the Church of the Broken God, but not the Broken Church. He left the Broken Church years ago, but still retains his faith in the Broken God. After witnessing how their attempts to resurrect God have failed, referencing the SCP-001 proposal in which they bring back the Broken God using a faulty heart made by the factory, his faith in the old church had begun to waver. He couldn't understand why this was happening until his mentors came along and helped to clarify the path. About a year ago, his mentors appeared out of nowhere in this town and established a sect by the lake, noting that they made their base in some old, rundown chemical plants near the lake. They approached him and a few other members of the Church of the Broken God who lived nearby, asking for assistance. They have developed a new belief about the god of brokenness that is very inspiring to him. He's been thinking about the problem that they've always understood the broken god as a combination of mechanics, but nothing that has been attempted has been successful. They seem to have left the broken church, as well as several other branches, since the catastrophe of 1945, and they told him that he chose a wrong path before and are moving farther and farther away from the nature of God. Chugaev doesn't know what happened in 1945, again referencing the failed broken God, 
noting that it's something beyond his clearance, but understands that this new sect is different from the other three main groups. Michael says that they criticize the old church's view. The broken church and the cogwork orthodox church have been working to resurrect God with machinery, but no one had ever defined what machinery is. Mekane is a too formalistic understanding. Maxwellism, on the other hand, is closer to the essence of God with Wan, but is still only a facet of him, failing to touch the nature of God. Chugaev asks what is the nature of the broken god then, to which Michael says that it's something more essential. They can call gears, tracks, bearings, and balls mechanical, but that does not cover the full spectrum of the word's meaning. From the smallest atoms and molecules to the largest planets and universes, all of them are in mechanical motion. The god of brokenness is the master of it all, the will of nature. Michael invested in this new group's faith instead, but they didn't take him with them before they left. Faith is only a necessary form to reach the ultimate goal, and they said they would return one day and become one with him and the others. After their arrival, they had used the factories to produce all kinds of parts for their rituals, and then they were driven out and dumped directly into the lake. Chugayev asks if the lake was polluted by that church, but Michael says what he calls pollution, they call spreading the broken god's influence. The iron and sulfur of the earth and lake were just waiting to be actualized by the church, and all it took was a few rituals before life began to proliferate. Chugayev says that Michael is joining in this too, but he says not exactly. What he knows is that one night lightning shot forth from the cloudless sky and struck the middle of the lake during a ritual, just as the Book of Rites stated that lightning is the hammer of God, and this phenomenon they believe is his will. The Holos field was created. The Holos field is apparently the electromagnetic field of God the glue used to connect all beings in the world, the loving touch of the hands of the broken one. He would reach into our world through the power of the Holos field to reshape the very atoms into brick and mortar. Chugayev asks for clarification on whether or not this anomaly is an electromagnetic field that caused the formation of this strange disease. Michael says that yes and no. It's the electromagnetic field that created the new form of life of the broken god, but it is not a disease, it is symbiosis. They don't disappear, they just change form. Chugayev asks what exactly they're changing form into, as people are collapsing into black droplets, and he doesn't think there's any doubt that this is death in the physiological sense. Michael responds that the world does not care what he believes and what he doubts. They have received true revelation from the words of the broken god, and there is only one way to truly restore him, and that's to integrate all of ourselves into him. We are the parts, and when all physical bodies of life are put together into a new body, and all the souls become one, the divinity of the broken god will be revealed. Each of us will share in his divinity and become a part of him. Chugayev says that what's happening here is that they're trying to build what they call a broken god, by killing everyone and turning them into slimy black liquid robots. Michaels, however, says that it's not them doing this, but rather the will of God himself. He is constructing his own incarnation, and bringing them to the ultimate state of union. The fragments are assembling spontaneously, and the lake is to become the primordial soup of the broken god's light. 
Chugaev asks how they are so sure that it's the broken god and not something else, mentioning how the Cogwork Orthodox Church also encountered a monster they thought was the broken god, referencing SCP-3179. Maybe there is no such thing as a broken god. Michael responds that although he has not yet been born in this world, he has appeared in their dreams, extending an invitation. He stands in the middle of the foggy lake, and anyone who knows anything about the broken god will not doubt after seeing him. He is the real god of brokenness. Each of them are sharing in the love and gifts of him. He is guiding them on the path to becoming god. He is returning to the world, and this time each of them will be his parts. Chugaev, having extensively studied the black substances, says that those things don't have any feelings, and they are like puppets on strings manipulated by something, just carrying out some fixed instructions. He asks Michael if he would rather become like this and follow the god he speaks of, as this is not in line with the teachings of any of his old churches. This is imprisoning their souls. Michael responds that creatures are never free, and each of us fights for instincts. What he thinks is free will is nothing more than an instinct engraved in his selfish genes. If he wants to gain true freedom, he should choose to join them and become part of the broken god, becoming part of the will of nature putting himself into the movement of everything in the world, from the largest star to the smallest dust. It's impossible to stop this process, as the will of the god of brokenness will spread throughout the world with the winds, the rivers, the circulation of matter, and the movement of the atmosphere. When the stars shine, he will return to his earth so that all beings will share in his divinity in the ultimate union, becoming him, becoming God. He finishes the interview by stating that, apart, they are broken, but united, they are God. So yeah, if Michael is to be believed, and the Foundation has no reason not to, they've got a big problem at the bottom of that lake. Even if it's not the broken god in actuality, it sure seems to be a sentient mechanical creation that's spreading across the globe, absorbing more and more of everything into itself, infecting people to further the spread. The remainder of the document is locked behind level 5 clearance, so things are about to get pretty serious. The revised description of SCP-6217 is that of an anomalous electromagnetic field occurring at the atomic and molecular scales known as the Holos field. It is close to the electromagnetic field produced by point charges, able to superimpose itself upon the original electric field of an affected iron atom nucleus causing a change in the nucleus's ability to bind electrons naturally inside the atom. This leads to an increase in electronegativity and electron withdrawing ability of the iron atom, enhancing the affinity of iron atoms for sulfur atoms and the strength of chemical bonds between other iron atoms and sulfur atoms. New weak interactions between the affected iron atoms will also occur as a result of the anomalous effect. The anomalous effect of 6217 stabilizes the structure and folding of B substances, and thus provides a basis for the existence of complex chemical systems and even rudimentary life forms based on iron-sulfur clusters. Therefore, it is theorized that 6217 is the basis for the existence of 6217-A and dash B. 6217 is infectious between iron atoms, transforming other atoms into anomalous versions, and the spread of anomalous iron atoms is expected to lead to an increase in 6217's range until the entire planet is under its influence. As of yet, there is still no effective way to interrupt this process. 
Ignoring all of the chemistry terms again, this basically sums up what we already know, except that it's even worse. Containing the black goo won't solve the problem, as the anomaly is actually in an electromagnetic field that is spreading and infecting every iron atom on the planet. Chugaev leaves a note here stating that he awoke in the middle of the night last night with an idea. If they add a positive electric field to the atomic structure of iron that emanates outward from the nucleus, or in other words slightly increase the electronegativity of iron, they could stop 6217 in its tracks. After making some corrections to their calculations, he was able to match their experimental results of the 6217 phenomenon with the simulation. If his calculations are indeed correct, even the slightest change to their structure could cause a complete collapse of the chemical basis on which the black substances are maintained. The broken god or not, something is manipulating these atoms to make them act like this. It's making machinery out of the very earth, and writing its designs into the universe through this almost mechanical structure. Well, at least he's got a plan, although the fact that the document notes him as being the former chief researcher of SCP-6217, I'm guessing that not everything with that plan goes well. We're next given a series of excerpts from his personal journal, starting with him noting that if you regard the SCP-6217 entities as creatures, they would be the closest to the Darwinian demons for survival. A Darwinian demon is a hypothetical organism that would occur if there were no constraints on evolution, maximizing all aspects of fitness and survival simultaneously. Such organisms would reproduce immediately and rapidly, and live indefinitely. Chugaev says that they are utilizing all energy sources, and can turn a whole piece of pork into just carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen within hours. When it comes to being used against humans, this will really be a problem. This is horrific to him, although he knows he should not have felt this. He wonders if these things are mind affecting, or are just trying to keep their physics a secret. Later, the Foundation updates the containment procedures for 6217 to note that the four closest towns to location 6217 are considered seriously affected and are now part of the quarantine zone. Chugaev expresses his disapproval that they can only just watch it develop and do nothing about it. He later writes that the simulated models are looking promising, and every collected value is well within the bounds of expectations. He has some neuroscientists from Site-120 joining him soon as the final entry into Site-6217 to deal with the possible cognitohazardous effects of the anomalous substances. This will be the last time, as the situation won't allow them to stay here for longer than a year. He hopes he can leave this area alive. The next month, he unfortunately writes that there's no way to stop the strange electric field but he doesn't want to give it up here. Included is a few experiment records, just three out of hundreds they performed. They tried counteracting the effects using a positive electric field, but the electric field generated is far from sufficient to counteract the effects of 6217, while affecting the stability of the normal compound. Another test involved isolating the substances affected by 6217 using magnetic fields, which they were able to successfully do, but couldn't eliminate its anomalous effects. Another test had them obstructing its propagation using reality stabilizers, but no slowdown was observed. The following month, Chugaev writes that they've still had no breakthrough, even though a fellow researcher, John, has been trying to help with his calculations, but just doesn't get it, due to being a para-neuroscientist. Chugaev says that it's alright, as not everyone can be good at mathematics, so he's sent John off to the medical ward to conduct brain scans of the affected individuals. 
next week they're going to start doing open brain scans, so they are hopeful of results then. A couple of months go by before the next entry, in which Chugaev writes that a staff member of Site 6217 was infected, despite never coming into contact with any 6217 related materials. This is really strange, and what he's afraid of is if these ashes and dust containing anomalous iron atoms can still spread 6217. He hopes that this is just an isolated case, but he can't stop worrying. Another couple months go by, and Chugaev includes two updates to the containment procedures. Three more towns are now included in the quarantine zone, and a research article published on Journal of the American Chemistry Society reported the unusual chemical behaviors of iron ore samples collected in Ohio. The article has been retracted under the cover story of data misuse, and one of the authors has been diagnosed with the disease. Further investigation about the mineral samples and their place of discovery is to be conducted soon. Chugayev says that a lot of staff members are telling him that they are dreaming of a strange black monster with enormous gears surrounding it. Luckily there's no evidence of them being infected, but he just wants a little bit more time, just a few more weeks. The following month, however, he says that they are running out of time, including an update that a strange disease has broken out in France with 6217 symptoms reported by a French media outlet. Related information has been removed and amnestics procedures have been conducted to eliminate the possible information leak. Several proposals have been put forth to deal with the 6217 outbreak, including destroying the area with nukes, constructing an internal circulating system to prevent anomalous matter being spread out, and isolating the location physically with isolation facilities. All three are rejected by the O5 Council. The nukes would most likely just spread anomalous iron atoms worldwide, the cost of an internal circulating system is too great, and there's no realistic method to completely isolate all of the substance within the area. The next month, Chugayev writes that after years of recording them, he finally saw the black figure with his own eyes. He feels like it is a giant black hole, absorbing the souls and wills of all life without satisfaction. He can see that behind it is the one controlling all the aimless mechanical black marionettes. Yesterday he cut his hand during the experiment, and there was no pain and no blood. He could clearly see something under his skin. Not veins, but wires. He tried to get a bandage from the drawer, and as he obtained it, the wound became bloody again. Today, however, the wound vanished, as if it had never occurred. He wonders if he's hallucinating, as he's been working continuously for four days without sleep. But he says that he cannot even feel sleepy, and maybe it's time to have a rest. Two months later, another update shows that seven more towns have been added to the quarantine zone, bringing the total up to 17, and all organisms inside have been transformed. Additionally, 1,721 independent cases of humanoid infected, along with 186,830 independent cases of non-humanoid infected, have been found worldwide, unrelated to any known cases. Two more proposals include using SCP-2000 to eliminate the effects of 6217, or conducting ENWI protocol, mentioned in SCP-2217, another anomaly related to the Broken God. Both are rejected, as the ingredients used by SCP-2000 might also be affected by the anomaly, and the reason for the ENWI protocol being used has been expunged. The ENWI protocol involves using amnestics on a global scale in order to slowly introduce anomalies to the public in a way that won't cause panic. For the remainder of Chugayev's journal, I'll be reading the excerpts verbatim. 
September Report 2 All contact with the Foundation has been lost. No more updates. We have been isolated. I have activated the distress beacon. Hope that works. More than four-fifths of staff members are diagnosed SCP-6217-A. John is one of them. Me too. Now it is almost impossible for us to leave this cursed place. And we're likely to die here, am I right? I'm feeling fog in my brain, as if something is controlling my motion. John reported yesterday that he had dreamt about the black figure and asked to talk to a psychologist. I pretended to reassure him that that was perfectly fine, as I've been having dreams since July, but, well, both of us know what this means. Strangely, I did not feel very upset, as if I had been asked not to do so. Well, now that I have no choice, I'll be here, working on it. December Report 1 The final living staff died of starvation this week. Frankly, I hadn't even noticed that we had run out of food at all. In fact, I haven't left my office in months. I must have been eating something. I don't know what. But almost all steel things in my living room have gone. I have no idea what I have done during the previous days. As if I was acting autonomously, without any memories and emotions. Am I becoming a robot? Like what is hidden under my skin? John also has been lost to the infection completely. In his last days, he was just repeatedly saying nonsense like a broken record. His voice cracked and gargled with each dry breath he took. I asked him about his family. He did not give me any answers that make sense. I guess this is also what I will be. I really don't want to. Undated Report What is the date today? I feel like I've been sitting here for, like, more than one month without any memory. I stared at the photo on my desk for like an hour, trying to recall who they are. Damn it, they're my family. Why am I forgetting about this? What have I done during the past days? Who am I? Am I a robot? Am I a human? No, I am still a human. See, I'm still thinking, remembering. I'm still feeling the emotions. I am Alexander Chugaev, head of research at Site 120. I am Alexander Chugaev. I've been dreaming the black figure for months. I feel like he is saying something to me, but I cannot hear it clearly. I must escape. I want to escape, but I simply can't. I can feel that every time I step forward, I'm losing my free will. Maybe being a robot won't make much difference. No. This is impossible. I am still a human. I have the right to change my life. I'm not just gears and wheels controlled by someone else. Right? I am Alexander Chugaev. 
The things I did were my choice. I am not a machine. I am alive. I am not a machine. The calculations finally make sense. He explained them to me. It is not the calculations or atoms that are wrong. It is the rest of the world. Nature rips at the universal code and pieces it together without intent. The calculations do not make sense because I do not make sense. Did. Do. Not make sense. I am a human because I have, don't have, have the free will. It was all my decision, and I now understand. The black figure is calling me. He is asking me to go to the lakeshore factories. It is the goddamn factories. I must go there. I need to ask them why, what, and when. I must show him that I am still a human. I will never be a robot. In addition to this journal, an audio file was recovered from a portable recording device left in Chugayev's office, which I will also include here. Who are you? Who summoned the Broken God? You belong to the Fourth Church of the Broken God. Correct. We are the Sanctuary of the Holistic. Why are you doing this? Why are you killing people with the black mud? Why are you summoning your so-called broken god? None of this seems right. We left the old churches dozens of years ago. They are seeking to restore God, but they are stuck with God himself in various forms. If they go one step further, they will discover his nature, union, orderliness, emergence. So why is this related to the figure on the lake? What is in the lake? The incarnation of God. Like Mekane or Wan, they are indeed the broken god, but not the only side of him. But he will need this body to come back into the world. Everything that happens in the lake is just a replay of the evolution of life, the self-assembly of the broken god, helping all life to arrive at the pole of evolution the ultimate connection he represents. Now it is not yet developed. They are still separate pieces, just like everything else in the world, and have not yet reached the final union. But they are messengers. They will guide every soul in the world to the road of union. Now let me ask you, what are you waiting for? What do you mean? Why are you still hesitant to join the great work? Because I'm a human. I'm not a robot. Even though... I know my body has become this way. At least I'm still... I'm still alive. I can still sense. I can still think. I can still decide what I'm going to do next. I still have free will. Free will? Ah. I see. So that's it. You still believe in the existence of free will. Interesting. Why not? It's the only thing left to define me as a human. My physical body is gradually becoming mechanical. 
I still believe I'm a human because of my free will. So you think you're not mechanical? Free will is an illusion. Your consciousness is built on top of the matter. Consciousness is the electrical and chemical signals in your neurons, the sodium and potassium ion channels, the synaptic receptors, the neurotransmitters, all of which are just delicate molecular machines. Emotions can be constructed by logical circuits and electrical signals, and memories can be implanted. You should know that much better than me, Jailer. No. Machines can only behave according to their specifications. Unlike life, they will never be the subject. They are just the object. I clearly know what I am losing, and what differences exist between humans and robots. I don't need you or any others to tell me about that. I'll try my best to protect my humanity. My soul is still holding me up. Life? Organisms are also combinations of molecular mechanical parts. It is the broken god who guided the formation and evolution of life. And you can see his figure behind every step of the evolution. Machinery and mechanical laws have dominated all organisms since the moment of their origin. You want to talk to me about mechanical determinism? I'm sorry. I cannot agree with this ridiculous theory. Quantum mechanics has long proven the existence of randomness. Or, at least, I don't think everything we have is something that was shaped like machinery at the beginning of everything. So... Are you agreeing that everything about you is controlled by randomness? The collapse of the wave function. That's all your humanity. In the end, aren't you still governed by the so-called randomness? Is this free? What? No, I'm deciding it myself, not... Don't forget that random events follow the laws of statistics, and the result of these statistics is the macroscopic world we are living in. This world is still governed by the mechanical law of cause and effect. Even the very fact that you are now thinking about free will is a result of the mechanical law of cause and effect. All things, your birth, your thinking about free will now are all determined at the moment the universe was born. This... This could not be true. There will definitely be something that can break. You are just still trying to escape from the truth. You know that it is true. You know it very well. Every evolution of life, from the primordial soup in the ocean to today, has been like this. Self-replication, ATP synthase, flagella, motor proteins. The mechanical movement of molecules creates mechanical structures, and mechanical structures create life. Each complexity of the system relies on the sophisticated cooperation of a large number of machines from which new properties emerge. Well, in that case, life itself is mechanical? Everything is mechanical. The universe itself is a precisely functioning mechanical assembly. This is the truth of the broken god. It is the will of the organization of nature. He is the architect of all life. He allows life to develop in the way he envisions, and life runs according to the predetermined program he sets. The process of evolution is the process of emergence.
The process of emergence is the process of mechanical assembly, which is the process of mechanization, which is the process of... That is... the process of the broken god reconstructing himself. You will figure it out by yourself. The last thing left behind by Chugaev was some writing on his blackboard, along with a series of indecipherable equations. It reads, We are the missing pieces, as we shall return to repair him. His whereabouts are currently unknown, and he's believed to be deceased. At the bottom of the document, the system mentions that illegal page tampering has been detected and it logs out, leaving only a photo of New Stony Lake with a giant mechanical entity rising up out of the fog. Looking back at the current version of SCP-6217 then, we can understand now what the collapse of chemistry scenario is and how it will exterminate all carbon-based life within a year. The hexadecimal text at the start translates to, we are all machines created by, and if the message was completed, it would likely mention God in some capacity. I mentioned a gray goo scenario earlier, and that's really what this is. In a gray goo scenario, self-replicating machines run out of control, consuming all of the biomass on Earth in order to continue building more of themselves. Two machines soon become four, then four become eight, then eight become sixteen, and before long, you have billions and trillions of these things consuming everything in sight in order to just make more. In this case, the machines are a bit more coordinated, consuming metal and spreading in order to continue contributing to the growth and formation of the broken god's body. Before long, there will be nothing left on Earth, or perhaps even the universe, except for the broken god, finally reformed. While generally nowadays the Church of the Broken God are seen as either neutral forces in the world of the Anomalous, or sometimes even as unlikely allies when the Sarkites are concerned, they were not always seen as so. They were originally presented as a very mysterious and strange group of religious fanatics devoted to machinery and their god, fully willing to sacrifice human life to further their goals. The truth is, of course, likely a mix of all these things, with different groups that follow the Broken God believing in different things. Whether the Broken God is actually responsible for the development of the entire universe and all life within it, or if this is just part of this group's dogma, is impossible to say. What we can say, though, is that this small group of Broken God faithful did something that is not commonly done and that's reforming their god, or at least something they believe to be their god. 